Okay, everyone. Uh, good morning again. Um, today we're going to talk about somatic mutations in cancer, and, um, and the learning objectives are going to be, um, well, they're listed here. Hopefully you've had a chance to read them, but basically we're going to look at drivers, passengers, uh, oncogenic versus loss of function mutations. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about mutation classes and rates and signatures. And we'll look at some examples of somatic mutations that have clinical relevance. Um, and then we'll move on to statistical considerations for modeling uh, allelic distribution, um, allelic distributions from a next-gen sequencing data. Um, and we'll uh, consider some analytic approaches to uh, mutation characterization. So uh, we'll go over some tools, uh, some of the tools that you'll be using today in the lab. Uh, and we'll talk in particular about functional annotation using dbSNP and Cosmic, um, and considering purity and ploidy um, and the effect of purity and ploidy on the observed variant allelic frequencies. And then finally, we'll end with uh, how one might interpret mutations. Um, so let's start again um, with this diagram from yesterday. Uh, so this is where we discussed the idea that cancer is an evolutionary process that really conforms to the rules of Darwinian selection. And so I want to add some definitions today, specifically that cancers arise as a result of driver mutations. Um, so these are mutations that directly or indirectly confer a selective advantage, a growth advantage to the cells that have these mutations. So a selective advantage is basically the difference between the birth and death in a cell population. And the difference between the birth and death in a normal cell population is uh, pretty much zero in a tissue that is self-maintaining. So any mutation that either increases the birth rate of cells, so the division rate of cells, or any mutation that decreases the death rate of cells will confer a selective advantage. Um, so as part of this process of mutagenesis, um, there will also be other mutations that do not confer any selective advantages, or perhaps that confer a negative selective advantage, so they decrease the birth rate, for instance, and those will be outcompeted. Uh, but you will also have a lot of passenger mutations. So in, um, in uh, cancer genomics, uh, one of the key tasks is to separate these driver mutations from passenger mutations. And so this is a, a big challenge. How do we tell these apart? Um, so these passenger mutations arise also during every cell cycle. Um, and so as cells divide and gain more and more mutations, and at some point gain that key mutation that gives them a selective advantage, they already have these additional thousand other mutations. And so when we look at this green clone, it will have a thousand mutations. Uh, and we have to identify which one of those is the one that gave it that growth advantage. So when we profile a tumor, um, uh, a diagnosis, it will be a mixture of these cells, some of which had uh, the mutation that gave rise to the green clone, and some of which had the mutations that gave rise to the orange clone, and there will be lots of passenger mutations in common or specific to each clone. Um, okay, so tumors have this heterogeneity both in space and in time, because when we look at tumors at recurrence, often we see a different mutational distribution. Um, and uh, just a quick note on drivers. Uh, they can often be, uh, so when people talk about drivers, they, they just say driver mutations, but really some mutations are necessary as initiating events, um, some are necessary as maintenance events. If they happen early on, they don't necessarily initiate a tumor, uh, but they're required for maintenance of the cell population, and some are only um, drivers in the face of specific selective pressure, like, like uh, um, disease re or, or a resection and then chemotherapy. And so there will be drivers of progression, but not necessarily of initiation. Okay, so today, unlike yesterday where we talked about uh, copy number variations and alterations, which are um, events that encompass thousands of base pairs, today we're going to talk about the tiny things in the genome that matter. So these are point mutation. Here's one example. Uh, here we see the normal cell uh, DNA. Uh, this is just a bit of the reference sequence uh, from the p53 gene, and this red base indicates a change from the reference, uh, and this change, this T, is just in the tumor cell. Um, and so 
so the thing to note here is that we're looking for somatic events. This is a somatic event. This event is only found in the tumor cell DNA and not in the normal cell DNA. There are also germline events, so mutations can happen in the germline, and then you get cancer predisposition syndromes. You could have a p53 mutation in the germline, and such a person would have um, Lee from any syndrome, so they would be predisposed to uh, multiple types of tumors. Okay, so uh, mutations uh, have a few main classes. Uh, the mutations that happen in coding regions of genes include missense mutations. So these are changes that um, that uh, lead to a change in the amino acid sequence of the protein. Uh, so often these occur in the first or second position of a codon, which is a group of three bases. Um, and these three bases are recognized by the cellular machinery um, as a unit uh, that is then matched with a particular amino acid. So if you change a bit of this unit, you'll get a match with a different amino acid. So you can see in this example that the second base of this codon is changed to a T, um, and then the amino acid, instead of being glutamine, is now valine. And so this protein will have a substitution uh, at this position. <laughs> There are also silent uh, or synonymous uh, mutations. These often happen in the third uh, position of a codon. And the third position is called this wobble position. Um, it's less important than the other two. Many amino acids uh, will have codons that are the same on, over the first two bases, uh, but differ on the, uh, over the third one. So even though this uh, base is different, uh, we don't see a change in the protein in this particular case. Uh, so when we see synonymous mutations, in general in cancer, we don't think that they're functional. Uh, there could be rare cases where a synonymous mutation could be functional, for instance, by changing a splice site uh, or, or altering binding of some additional uh, protein that uh, binds with mRNA. Uh, but for functional mutations, we tend to filter these out. So we only focus on missense and nonsense, the next category. So these are truncating mutations. These are single base substitutions that in, in, uh, introduce a premature stop codon. Uh, so this is one of the class of mutations that you typically see affecting tumor suppressor genes, because that's a great way to inactivate a protein, is to just uh, truncate it halfway through or part of the way through. Um, and so here we see uh, we see a change in glutamine in the first position of this codon, and that changes it to a stop. Um, there are also uh, short insertions and deletions. Um, these are abbreviated as indels. Uh, so indels are trickier to detect from uh, short read sequencing data, uh, but basically they comprise two categories, frame shift uh, indels. These are small deletions on, or insertions. We can see here um, insertion of a T. So if we have an, a deletion or insertion of one or two bases, uh, or not a triplicate, uh, not, uh, not a, uh, a mul multiplicate of three, then that changes the reading frame. And so you can see here in this middle example that um, basically everything subsequent to this T is now read um, or corresponds to a different amino acid. So you frame shift the whole rest of the protein, often introducing a stop codon uh, fairly early. If you have an insertion of three bases or a deletion of three bases or any uh, multiple of three, then you just have an insertion or deletion of a whole codon. So you don't shift the whole rest of the protein. Um, you just take out a bit of it or add a bit, a bit to it. Um, so as I said, this is more of a computational challenge to detect these um, uh, compared to two-point uh, two mutations. Okay, so like copy number alterations, SNVs and point mutations have uh, typical patterns of frequencies in tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. And so this graph uh, depicts the patterns in oncogenes, uh, two examples here on top, and tumor suppressor genes, two examples on the bottom. Uh, and the, uh, these bars are essentially the genes. So here we have uh, PIK3CA, IDH1, RB1, and VHL. And each of these glyphs it corresponds to a mutation. So missense mutations in red and truncating mutations in this uh, black triangle. <coughs> and so the pattern that we observe often in um, uh, uh, oncogenes are these stacks of 
missense mutations. And so uh, these change the amino acid of the protein. So there will be a new version of the protein that has a gain of function or a switch of function. And so it's really critical that this gain or switch of function, that it's the, a particular amino acid that confers that, that functionality. So these are so-called hotspot mutations. Um, and so they will often, for instance, cause a protein to be constitutively active. Um, so the, the second protein is IDH1, isocitrate dehydrogenase. Uh, these are basically mutations are only seen at this one position. Uh, so it's very obvious which part of the protein is necessary for oncogenic transformation. It's this particular uh, codon or amino acid. And then the genes at the bottom are tumor suppressor genes, and they show this, this classic pattern of loss of function. Uh, so a lot of the, these mutations in red are missense, and they will, um, they will essentially inactivate the protein. As opposed to activating a protein like we see for oncogenes, uh, and, and often there's only one way to activate a protein, there are many, many ways to disrupt a protein. There's lots of ways to destroy something. Uh, so you can see that these mutations have some clustering, but not really. They're throughout. And then on the bottom, we see these black triangles, which are the truncating mutations. So, um, so these proteins in many cancer samples are um, uh, inactivated, and they're a, a classic tumor suppressor uh, pattern. And someone yesterday was asking, do we often see mutations or copy number alterations or both? It really depends on the uh, particular gene. Um, uh, so, for instance, p53 is more often mutated. Uh, patch 1, another tumor suppressor, is often mutated on one copy and deleted on the other copy. So you get the two hit. Um, so it really depends on the gene. And we'll see how we might take a look at it for genes of interest in a second. Okay, so consortium projects like the TCGA uh, have really aimed to sequence large cohorts of people uh, or tumors um, to find in an unbiased way all the mutations in tumor suppressors and oncogenes. Uh, so get as much data to start to see those patterns uh, for genes other than the ones that are always, uh, that are obvious, that are coming up. Uh, so we can start to understand cancer biology. So the goal here is to find those events that cause the phenotypic attributes of these hallmarks of cancer uh, that we talked briefly about yesterday. Um, and so that could explain how these hallmarks are acquired, so how, um, uh, how, how these transformations um, happen. So let's take a quick look at one of these cancer genome landscape papers um, that revealed uh, some patterns of these mutations. So this is a, this is a mutation from, uh, or a paper from 2013, um, and basically this is a synthesis analysis of the mutational landscape of tumors from many different uh, types of cancer from many tissues of origin um, in both pediatric and adult tumors, uh, so across a, a range of ages. Uh, and in general, it looks like there are about 120 to 140 genes that are recurrently mutated in human cancers, so out of the 20,000 genes we have. Uh, in any particular tumor, um, there are between two to eight uh, acquired driver genes. And so it takes multiple hits to make a cancer. Uh, we don't often see tumors with just one uh, mutation, or we almost never see tumors with just one mutation. Uh, and so it takes that many hits. It takes a few se sequential hits to uh, change the phenotype of a normal cell progressively to become a malignant cell. Uh, so however, these are not the only mutations in a tumor. Uh, on average, a tumor, so that's depicted in this plot. Uh, this is the average number of coding mutations in a tumor that change the amino acid or are truncating or in some way damaging. So there are on average about 33 to 66 genes with protein coding changes. So these would be drivers plus passengers. Um, there are some notable outliers, uh, melanomas and lung cancers. Uh, these have uh, mutations in the hundreds um, and also involvement of, of potent mutagens, so melanoma and lung cancer are associated with smoking and, um, and UV radiation. Uh, and they're only outmutated by uh, these tumors that have defects in DNA repair, so mismatch repair. So these are a lot of the colorectal cancers, and uh, also there are um, 
if you have a germline mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes, then you will have, for instance, um, a mismatch repair deficient brain tumor. So a lot of the gliomas are ultra hypermutated uh, if they fall in this category. Um, it turns out that there are more tumor suppressor genes uh, that are mutated compared to um, oncogenes. So mutations predominate in tumor suppressor genes rather than oncogenes, which is, uh, which is um, in a way unfortunate because oncogenes are much easier to target therapeutically. If something is overexpressed, it's easy to knock it down. Um, if a tumor suppressor is missing, it's very difficult to add it back or to add that functionality back. So again, this goes back to what we were talking about yesterday with the PARP inhibitors, that we need to look at pathways because tumor suppressors and oncogenes are really two sides of a pathway. And so uh, drug targeting really uh, needs to be um, performed or thought about from, th from that perspective. Okay, so the most frequently mutated gene in the human uh, genome that leads to cancer is p53. Uh, this is uh, a gene that's involved in programmed cell death and DNA repair. Uh, if there are significant abnormalities in the genome of a cell that's going through the cell cycle, p53 will prevent that cell from completing the cell cycle and uh, are targeted for cell death. And so it's kind of a built-in safety system to not let cells uh, accumulate uh, too many mutations. And so mutations in this gene allow cells to survive <coughs> despite massive genomic rearrangements um, or mutations and proceed through the cell cycle. <clears throat> so this is the most, uh, this is sort of the, the culprit in cancer. I, re I remember uh, doing a study where we were sequencing recurrent uh, medulloblastomas and we were really eager to see the results of what gene was recurrently mutated in our uh, in our recurrent tumor cohort, and of course it was p53. So when we saw the results, we were in a way a bit disappointed because we didn't discover anything new. But in another way, it makes perfect sense because this is the way that uh, that cells, uh, sort of cancer cells, sort of escape the the built-in limitations um, and and uh, acquire resistance to therapy, for instance. Um, does anyone know why elephants do not get cancer? Do you remember reading this in the in the paper? Yeah, they have like 60 copies of p53. So, so, uh, so elephants don't get cancer. Yeah, and uh, when they sequenced the genome of the elephant, they found that elephants have about 60 copies of p53. So their built-in system is has a large set of redundancy. Um. Just one more question I just had in mind. So you're talking about oncogenes, right? So uh, tumor suppressor and oncogenes. Mm -hmm. um, evolutionarily speaking, is there any uh, purpose for oncogenes? Like they they are the ones, um, as far as I understand, one is tumor suppression, and so if something goes wrong, then maybe to suppress mm -hmm. cancer. But oncogenes give rise to cancer. So, yeah. So, is there any benefit? Why do we even have those? So, the terms oncogene and tumor suppressor gene are really what we call those genes that are, that when something goes wrong with their normal function in the cell, um, are what drive cancer. So, these genes, their normal function in the cell of, of oncogenes, uh, so normal PI3 kinase, is involved in growth and cellular replic replication. So, you need your cells to replicate. Uh, tumor suppressor genes are those genes that are the balance to, to genes like PI3 kinase because you have feedback, feedback loops. You don't want to stop all cellular replication, otherwise the organism doesn't grow. Uh, but you need this balance between the two. So when the balance is, um, is altered, then you, you get a, a phenotype like cancer. Um, have people looked at C bioportal yet? Hands, yay, maybe a, less than a third of people. So this is um, a portal for a lot of this data um, that has come out of the TCGA. Uh, so you can um, put in, I think, up to 100 genes of interest. Um, I put in one gene of interest, P53. Uh, but basically, it gives you everything that has been found um, about this gene in the TCGA cohort. So here we see the incidence of mutations in p53 
in all the cancers that were sequenced as part of TCG. And of course, it's too small to read because this tail is very long, uh, but you can appreciate that there's a lot of green. So a lot of these cancers have, uh, and here I've zoomed in on uh, the end of this distribution. So you can see the, w the Y scale is up to 100%. And so some tumors, almost 100% of tumors um, in certain types of tumors have P53 mutations. There are some tumors on the southern end of the scale that uh, do not have very frequent p53 mutations, uh, but I encourage you, if you are uh, curious about any gene, to look it up in CBioPortal and click along on the tabs, and you'll see how mutations correlate with expression, for instance, uh, if there are what kinds of events affect that, um, that particular gene. So in this case, green means mutations, so this gene is often mutated. Um, not amplified, but you might see that uh, PI3 kinase, for instance, is amplified or mutated in that hot st hot spot fashion. Um, so it's a really great resource for exploring uh, uh, these types of alterations. So that's P53, the guardian of the genome. Uh, what about the other uh, 120 or so genes that are frequently mutated in human cancers? Um, so these are shown here. These are these are genes that are significantly <coughs> mutated uh, to a greater degree than you would expect by chance. So they, so like P53. Um, so this figure depicts uh, these 127 genes. These are all these rows. The gene names are on the right. Um, and the cellular processes in which these genes are involved is how the genes are grouped. So we see here um, transcription factors, regulators, histone modifiers, genome integrity, uh, receptor tyrosine, uh, tyrosine kinases, cell cycle, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so there are a lot of processes uh, in the cell that can be co-opted to, uh, 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 to take part in the oncogenic transformation. And so the way to read this plot is that uh, what each square shows is essentially the columns are the different kinds of cancer that were profiled. Um, and again, the rows are all the different genes. And the number and the color corresponds to the proportion of the cases of that kind of cancer that has a mutation in this gene. And so you can see that the darker the color, the more percent of cases have a mutation in that gene. And so P53 is right here. It's very easy to pick out. It's basically a red bar almost all the way across because every cancer uh, nearly has a P53 mutation. Uh, there are other examples like I think that's VHL up there in ki kidney cancers. Uh, and so VHL, uh, so P53 is, is not highly recurrently mutated in kidney cancers, but VHL is one of the uh, main ways to, uh, to initiate that, um, uh, that malignancy. <coughs> and so we see these patterns of uh, genes, um, I think PI3, it's too small for me to read. Do you guys see PI3 kinase? <laughs> is it this one? Yeah, so PI3 kinase is another one that is recurrently mutated in, in a number of different cancers. Uh, and so some of these were not surprising. Um, uh, and what was surprising was um, that there were some new categories of, of, um, of cellular processes that are involved in, in tumorigenesis. So some we knew about before, like MAPK signaling, PI3 kinase, wind signaling, uh, and some are new pathways like splicing or transcriptional regulation um, or metabolism and histones. So these indicate the potential for development of new therapies. Um, and these new mutational themes would not really have been obvious without this sort of broad survey in an unbiased way of mutations in the genome. Okay, so some mutations... Uh, define cancers, uh, as we saw, and there's a lot of clinical utility uh, in terms of knowing the status of mutations um, in particular genes in, in specific cancer types. And so, for instance, p53 mutations uh, define this high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Uh, if you don't see p53 mutations in one of these cancers, you might suspect that it's a misdiagnosis, for instance. BCR-ABLE translocations are diagnostic of CML. If a patient has a BCR-ABLE translocation, uh, you can give them Gleevec. Um, so there are lots of companion diagnostics now emerging for, for these therapeutics, uh, most common of which are these tests for EGFR mutations in lung cancer. Um, 
uh, so these would uh, correspond to uh, a recommendation for anti-EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, BRAF V600E uh, mutations in melanoma. Uh, if a patient has this <coughs> mutation, uh, they would be a good candidate for this particular drug, uh, and so on and so forth. And so there's, there's a, a good resource for finding which uh, targeted therapies uh, and diagnostics are, are available on the market. And of course, um, uh, mutations also evolve and emerge um, as potent markers of drug resistance. And so, uh, for instance, uh, mutations in EGFR, uh, when a patient is treated with anti-EGFR therapy, um, are really um, a, a mark of uh, an indication of resistance for that treatment. So anti-EGFR resistant tumor will develop a, a secondary mutation that allows them to, uh, to become resistant. And same with BRCA. Um, BRCA is often, it's a tumor suppressor, so often it has uh, indels, so insertions that put it out of frame. And when you treat that tumor, they will have a secondary insertion or deletion that will put it back into frame. So the tumors evolve to, uh, uh, to counteract therapies. Uh, okay, so we looked at this one uh, briefly. This is IDH1 in glioblastoma. This was an important discovery. Uh, this is a metabolism gene, so it was really surprising when IDH1 was identified as uh, a highly recurrent mutation in, in gliomas. Uh, but really, the nature of this protein has opened up a new investigation about the role of metabolism in this disease. And so the mechanism is, is based essentially on this gain-of-function mutation. Uh, when, this, uh, when this gene is mutant, it generates a rare metabolite, which accumulates in these cells and actually competitively inhibits uh, histone demethylases. And so the effect in gliomas is that uh, tumors have increased levels of histone methylation across the genome, um, especially repressive marks, and this is a block to differentiation. So, um, so we see epigenetic changes as a result of this mutation in a in a metabolism gene, which is a very uh, surprising uh, turn of events. Um, on its own, it's not sufficient to initiate tumors, but coupled with additional events like p53 mutations, um, <clears throat> these turn out to play a big role in tumor tumorigenesis, and actually there's a lot of research activity now uh, devoted to studying this process um, and how it can be co-opted for therapeutic benefit. Uh, here's another example. This is from Sorab Shah's lab. Um, and this came from start studying a rare form of ovarian cancer. Uh, in this case, they performed RNA sequencing and noticed that at this particular position in the FOXL2 gene, uh, there was a recurrent mutation present essentially in every case of this rare ovarian cancer. Um, and so when they looked in an additional cohort, they found that every patient had this mutation. And so this is what's called a pathognomic event. Uh, this is a, a mutation that essentially defines the etiology of that disease, um, like BCR able for, for CML. And some of these cases of really rare cancers can be hard to diagnose, and having this type of mutation uh, it is essentially what can provide a really high accuracy uh, molecular diagnostic. Um, we talked briefly about uh, PI3 kinase. Uh, these ha this gene has a couple of hotspots. Um, lots of targeted inhibitors have been developed, but they don't work very well, so this is still an active area of investigation. Um, this, I'm going to skip over this. This just depicts the uh, reading frame of the mutation. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the pathway in which, uh, in which PI3, so the, context, the genetic context in which PI3 kinase is found and the signaling pathway that it's part of. And so this sort of gets back to the question about um, why do we even have tumor suppressor genes or oncogenes? And so this is actually the normal cellular uh, context of a gene like this. How many people have seen KEG pathways before? Yeah, okay, so more than half the people. So, uh, so basically this, uh, this is a curated um, uh, diagram that describes the relationships between genes uh, from experimental evidence and from literature. Uh, and and you, you can see things start here on the left and end up on the right. Um, and you can appreciate that PI3 kinase, which is right here, is pretty much at the top of this uh, uh, of the structure. And so signals come in from the left and converge through uh, PI3 kinase uh, and downstream to AKT, 
and AKT um, then triggers a cascade of downstream effectors that promote cell cycle progression and cell survival. So the impact of an activating mutation at the top of the pathway in a gene like PI3 kinase or AKT uh, is huge compared to mutations in downstream effectors. So if you may mutate this gene, you'll have a very small effect because you're very uh, close to the endpoint, whereas if you mutate something upstream, uh, you have uh, an effect on the whole cascade. And then you can also notice in this pathway diagram that we have here P10. So this is the tumor suppressor we keep mentioning, uh, and it's frequently mutated uh, uh, or deleted. And that's actually a powerful way to... P10 normally turns off this, uh, this pathway, or it, it decreases signaling through AKT. And so the input um, and the brakes on the input are normally in balance, and if you either increase signaling through PI3 kinase or decrease the normal breaking of, of the signaling propagation through, by taking away P10, then you have a lot of cellular uh, proliferation or you have way too much cellular proliferation. Okay, so here's an example of another tumor suppressor gene, ARID1A, uh, where sequencing, so, a sequen so sequencing revealed that this was a tumor suppressor because um, uh, the researchers saw this particular pattern. So this is a classic tumor suppressor pattern. So sequencing essentially gets us, or is one way to classify uh, um, uh, functionally classify genes into tumor suppressors or oncogenes. Okay, so this table basically summarizes some of the important mutations that are currently being tested for uh, and, which are, and for which there are targeted agents um, and for which clinicians could prescribe a therapy, for instance. Uh, we've talked about some of these, and in the next slide we're going to see an example of the BRAF V600E mutation. Uh, so basically this is a this is a mutation that's carried by half of patients with melanoma. Uh, it leads to constitutive activation of downstream signaling through the MAPK pathway, and 90% of these mutations are at that one particular uh, amino acid, 600. So it changes it from a valine to a, a glutamic acid. And venurafenib is the drug that they were testing in this, so in this particular paper was the um, the paper that described the clinical trial that showed that vemurafenib, uh, which is an inhibitor of this particular uh, mutated form of BRAF, actually works really well. So in the top panel, we see the response in terms of tumor growth um, of each patient. So each patient is a bar, and tumor growth is on the Y scale, so we either see growth of tumor or shrinkage of tumor. Uh, in the presence of this particular drug, venurafenib, versus the standard of care for melanoma at the time, uh, um, which was uh, dacarbazine, I think. Uh, so you can see that for the standard of care, a subset, a small subset of, of patients had a benefit uh, from the standard of care drugs, but a lot of patients had a uniform decrease in their tumor mass as a result of uh, treatment with venurafenib. And so this was really exciting, and people thought uh, perhaps a drug like this would be uh, very useful in other cancers that have this BRAF V600E mutation. And so, um, so the, the, this hope led to testing of venurafenib in um, colon cancer, 10% of colon cancers have the same mutation, the V600E. Um, and what these plots show is that when you put on, when you take uh, xenografts of colon cancers that are mutant, uh, and you either uh, don't treat them or treat them with vemurafenib, there's really no difference. So vemurafenib doesn't make a difference in these cancers. Um, and that's because in these colorectal cancer cells, uh, there is activation of EGFR. And in melanoma cells, there is no activation of EGFR. So EGFR would be a parallel way to activate the same pathway that BRAF was activating. Um, and so the cellular context of the mutation actually really makes a difference. So in melanoma cells, the, the pathway activation is, is in such a way that by using this inhibitor, you're blocking all signaling through that pathway. And in colorectal cancer, even though you have the same mutation, that's not the case. And so just the presence of the mutation isn't necessarily sufficient to predict the, the consequence of, uh, of therapy or the response without the cell context. Um, another relatively recent discovery uh, is this description of mutations in the regulatory region of genes. Uh, this is in melanoma. 
so this was uh, the, these mutations occur both in sporadic and familial or inherited forms of melanoma, and uh, and really this was the first showcasing of uh, an inherited regulatory mutation that is a driver. Uh, previous to this, people were looking for protein coding events. Uh, so missense events, truncating events, uh, um, hotspot activating events. Uh, and now it became obvious that actually you can, you can have a mutation in the promoter uh, and at these, two pos at these two positions, this one and this one. Uh, and essentially what they do is they add um, transcription factor binding site. So when you have the mutation, certain transcription factors are able to bind here. And this promoter drives expression of TERT, which is... Um, the telomerase reverse transcriptase gene. So that's involved in genome maintenance. And so uh, cancers often have activation of TERT, and they'll have longer telomeres, and so uh, those cells are able to survive or, or become immortalized uh, because of this. So this is another way to turn on TERT um, that no one really suspected uh, previous to this. Um, and so uh, in sporadic melanoma, this, these are back-to-back -back papers in, a, in an issue of science, uh, in sporadic melanoma, these mutations are recurrent. Uh, they're found in 33% of primary melanomas and 85% of metastatic tumors. So they're actually really frequent. Um, and so these regulatory regions of the genome, if they're mutated, uh, that could actually be a really important tumorigenic mechanism. Um, and so that's a departure from the systemic characterization of just protein coding events that we've been focusing on. Uh, so don't forget to pay attention to the regulatory regions, especially if you have whole genome data. Uh, if you have whole exome data, then you don't have to worry about any of this. Um, okay. So what do these patterns of mutations across the genome uh, tell us about the biology of mutations in cancer? Uh, we've looked at some single genes, but um, there are two properties of of mutation patterns uh, that we can ascertain through whole genome or whole exome analysis. One is the mutation rate. So we already talked about this. There are some ultra-hypermutated tumors. Uh, there are some tumors that have specific uh, mutagenic uh, inputs, like um, um, in lung cancer or um, um, skin cancer, and those have a lot more mutations. Um, and so we're going to talk next about these mutational signatures, which kind of give us insight in the, the processes that um, influence um, the types of mutations we see in cancer genomes. So a great way to think about this is to consider these patterns of mutations. So this figure is from a, a recent pan-cancer report, and this really shows um, from the center to the outside uh, the abundance of mutations. These are the number of mutations per megabase. Um, each dot on this plot is an individual tumor, um, and each of these quadrants uh, defines uh, the type of mutation. So these are C to A mutations, these are C to T mutations, and so on and so forth. So you can see that some tumors don't have a lot of mutations and they cluster close to the center, and some tumors have a lot of mutations and they are sort of uh, scaled to the outside of, the, uh, of this plot. So these black dots, so each dot is colored by the type of tumor it is. Uh, and so you can see that these black dots are melanoma tumors. Um, and these are characterized, first of all, by many mutations. So they're, again, the, uh, some of the hypermutated ones. Um, and also that they mostly cluster in this quadrant. So they mostly have C to T mutations. So um, I, do you guys know why, why that is? Any guesses? Yeah, it's a, it's a signature for UV mutagenesis. So no other tumors would suffer from this because they're internal, for instance. Uh, but these uh, uh, melanomas are generated uh, through this mutational process. Uh, what about these C to A mutations? Smoking. Yeah, smoking. So smoking uh, is the big culprit for lung cancers. Um, and lung cancers that occur in patients who have smoked throughout their lifetime will have this pattern. And lung cancers do also occur in patients without a smoking history, and they do not have this pattern. And so smoking causes this pattern of mutations that causes this type of lung cancer. And so these mutational patterns tell us something about the biology of, of the tumors. Um, and 
they can be described as mutational signatures. So how many people have heard of mutational signatures before? Half. Uh, so mutational signatures are basically these six substitution patterns uh, represented uh, in a matrix. So I'm showing you here, this is just a, the first six signatures. So basically each substitution is represented in the context of the base preceding the mutation and the base after the mutation. So there's 96 possible combinations. So the x-axis of each one of these plots is the 96 uh, possible changes. And if we zoom into this particular uh, C to T part of signature one, uh, we see for instance that C to T mutations in the context of um, an ACG far outnumber those C to T mutations in the context of an ACT. And so we get this specific pattern. Um, these signatures have been derived from um, thousands of, sequ of sequence tumors uh, in 40 different types of cancers. Um, and they, for each mutational signature, we know the cancer type in which that signature has been found. And there is, uh, if possible, a proposed etiology for the mutational process underlying that signature. And so here's an example, uh, a couple of examples we've seen already. So the lung adenocarcinomas have the signature uh, four. So this, these are individual tumors. And you can see the, how many of the mutations correspond to each, or, or what proportion of mutations correspond to each signature. So signature four is responsible for a huge proportion of the mutations in each one of these particular cancers. And similarly for melanoma, signature 7, which is that UV-induced uh, signature, is responsible for essentially all of the um, mutations in these tumors. And so here we have some, um, we have information from, uh, so this is from the COSMIC database. Have you guys been to COSMIC? Yes, I see nodding. So COSMIC is great for um, a number of uh, purposes, but one of them is to look at mutational signatures. So for instance, uh, we can see uh, for each one of these tumors um, what the cancer types, or so for one of each of these signatures, what the cancer type was, um, what the proposed etiology is, and any additional mutational features. Um, so we're going to run later in the lab a mutational signature algorithm for our data. So you'll have a chance to do this and, and have a hands-on experience with this. And also, I encourage you to explore Cosmic as a resource for, uh, for reading about these signatures. Um, and so basically, if we look at all the signatures, uh, there are 30 signatures currently. As we sequence more and more cancers, we may find more signatures because there could be rare ways in which to induce uh, mutations that are not yet um, evident given our level of sampling. And here we see the 40 different tumors. So some signatures are essentially uh, ubiquitous and some signatures are specific to particular cancer types. Okay, so you'll have a chance to, uh, to look hands-on at some signatures in the lab. I'm gonna skip this slide and move on to statistical considerations for modeling allelic distributions from next-gen sequencing data. And just to revisit uh, the properties of the cancer genomes that need to be accounted for when we do mutation calling. Um, so we're interested in somatic mutations that are not in the germline of an individual. Uh, so it matters, uh, so the things that matter are, again, purity of the sample, so the tumor normal admixture. If your tumor DNA is contaminated with a lot of normal DNA, it's much harder to find mutations, uh, so that dilutes the signal. Uh, we know that there is intratumoral heterogeneity because that cancers evolve, and so by default there will be some level of heterogeneity. Um, there is genomic instability, so there will be copy number changes, LOH, and so on, that affect the observed frequency of a particular mutation in our samples. Um, and, um, and I just want to mention that the ideal way to do an experiment where we look for mutations is, especially somatic mutations, is to pair tumor and normal from the same patient. Uh, so I know some of you have exomes from uh, tumors that have no match normal, and in that case, it's actually really difficult to do um, a meaningful uh, analysis of the mutations unless you're also willing to look at germline uh, events, and especially if you, have, um, if you have known drivers in that disease, then you could look for their prevalence in your cohort. Um, 
knowing that you probably won't be able to distinguish somatic from germline events. So here is a simplistic flowchart uh, for an analytical approach. Um, this is what an analysis might look like. We start with a cohort of interest, so whatever it is that you want to sequence. Um, and of course, the first step is to align the reads to a genome. Um, these alignments are then put into one or more of these mutation calling tools, as well as tools for detection of copy number, as we saw yesterday, uh, and for detection of purity and ploidy, which is important, as I mentioned. Um, and so now, out of these analyses, we will have variant allele frequencies for the mutations, copy number ratios, and purity. Um, and then we would want to take those um, those mutations and annotate them um, with databases like, or with a tool like Anovar that uh, pulls annotations from databases like dbSNP and Cosmic. Um, and so we'll have functional annotations for all these genes. At which point we would like to correct the observed variant allelic frequencies because we know that there will be um, some level of purity or copy number ratio uh, that may affect them. And Instead of VAFs, we would like to work with CCFs, which are the cancer cell fractions. So in most uh, some genomics papers that you see um, in the literature these days, you will see plots of CCF, not uh, VAF. And so CCF is the, it basically tells you um, in what fraction of cancer cells your mutation is present in. Um, and then that uh, easily translates to splitting those mutations into ones that are clonal because they're in every cancer cell and ones that are subclonal because uh, they're later events and are only in a subset of cells. And then at the end, once we have the, this uh, nicely annotated, filtered, and, uh, and corrected VAF set of mutations, we can do interpretation and validations. Um, so first up, alignments. Um, alignments, have you guys talked uh, about alignments yesterday with Jared? Yeah, so you're experts at aligning. Um, so these basically are, um, there are many tools that will take reads and find the best match in the reference genome. Uh, so we would take one of these tools, BWA perhaps, uh, align our reads to the genome. Here's the reference genome on the bottom. Uh, and then uh, we would summarize the positions of interest as those that are different from the reference sequence. Um, and furthermore, those positions of interest to us in uh, a cancer, a somatic cancer, a mutation analysis would be the ones that are different from the reference uh, and different from the normal, so unique to the tumor. And so the way we do this uh, conceptually is that we would have the normal genome um, and thereafter the tumor genome, uh, and we would count a number of reads uh, that um, uh, cover each position. And so, and how many of those reads correspond to the reference allele or an alternate allele? And so we make this simple matrix here on the bottom that corresponds to the genotypes. Um, and so if we do this for the normal and the tumor, we can see in blue that there are these uh, positions that are different from the reference. So this is a C, which should, which in the reference is a G, but it's in every in every read of the normal. So this is a germline polymorphism. The normal has 100 the normal person just uh, has a CC at this position. And similarly, a GG um, at this position, or actually a GC, um, whereas the normal reference is a G. And so if we see the same distribution in the tumor, that means that there is no difference between the normal and the tumor. So in this case, we have ABAB. So these are the genotypes, just like we talked about yesterday. Uh, in this case, uh, oops, we have BB to BB, so no difference. Uh, but in this case, we go from being a homozygous A to being a heterozygous A and a heterozygous C. So we have a mutation. The base A is now changed to a C. So this C is different both from the reference and from the normal. So this, it's this type of somatic event that we uh, want to identify in shortlist. Um, and so the problem, of course, is that uh, there are many uh, such events in the genome, and most of them will be the same between the normal and the tumor because um, there are three million polymorphisms and only perhaps um, a few hundred uh, somatic mutations. Um, and so there are statistical ways to, to um, uh, 
to infer which positions are actually somatically mutated. So we would like to pick out uh, cases like this, where in the normal case, it's homozygous, and in the um, uh, tumor, it's heterozygous. And um, it, as we've learned to do mutation calling better and better, and as this data became more prevalent and tools evolved, uh, it became really important to work out what types of artifacts or biases are in the data that would influence mutation calls. Uh, and so one, one really important aspect of, of uh, designing these tools was to do validations. So this is from um, the work from Saurabh Shah's lab, uh, where they looked at 50 triple negative breast cancer tumor normal pairs um, and called 3,000 mutations um, and then validated them and found that 2,000 of them were not actually somatic. And so there's a large uh, input of artifacts that are going to um, add noise to this to, uh, uh, to these results. And so figuring out what's an artifact and what's not an artifact uh, is a lot of work uh, that was done. And now we have somewhat better uh, uh, tools. But this is um, this was some of the uh, some of the work that needed to be done in order to get to this point. And so here are some example artifacts that induce false positives. Um, on the top, we see the tumor. This is an IGV screenshot. You guys have looked at IGV already, so uh, you know that these gray bars are the reads. And then the, uh, the bases that are different from the reference are colored. And so what we see here is that um, this base actually um, has the intensity of the color corresponds to the base quality. Uh, so in the tumor, we don't see any of these bases, but in the, or sorry, in the normal, we don't see any of these bases, but in the tumor, we do. Um, and it turned out that in this case, if they redid the alignment with different parameters, these reads would go elsewhere in the genome. So this is because there are similar, similar uh, sequences throughout the genome, and so depending how you do your initial alignment actually affects uh, how well you can do muta mutation calling or what types of artifacts are introduced. Um, Indels is another big one. Um, so here we see a case where there's a structural rearrangement. So this, uh, this position is deleted. Uh, it's also deleted in the normal. Uh, but if the reads aren't aligned properly, then instead of opening up the proper gap in the read, so uh, opening up a big gap, instead what the aligner did in this case is it just introduced um, some mismatches at the end. So it opened up a small gap and introduced mismatches. And most aligners have a higher penalty for opening gaps than for introducing mismatches. So if you see mismatches at the end of a read or mismatches that kind of go along with a small gap, uh, then that is often a cause of artifacts um, that are due to indels. And so later I'll, I'll mention indel realignment. Uh, it's in positions like this that you would want to take these reads and realign them locally uh, to find a better fit for those reads. Um, low base quality is another one. Uh, maybe it's hard to see here, but you can see that the intensity of, of this base is not very high. So that corresponds to the, uh, um, uh, to the base quality. If you don't see any high quality bases, or if you see a big mix of high quality and low quality bases, then that position would be a bit fishy. Um, another type of artifact are, is uh, when all reads um, actually that support the variant are from the same strand. So if so, there are positions in the genome that would have a secondary structure, for instance. So some some sequences will sort of form the secondary structure, and you can traverse. You can traverse this, uh, this sequence from one end uh, much more easily than you can traverse it from the other end. So from the other end, because you're on the opposite strand, uh, you might just skip over a base or misread a base, whereas from the, um, the previous strand, you would correctly read through the, through the obstruction. And so if you see only one uh, direction of read supporting your variant, then that is a very suspicious case and probably an artifact. Um, and then sometimes there is no observable reason for why a mutation was called. I don't know why, <laughs> why uh, a mutation would have been called here, but clearly there is no uh, variant.
and some true positive examples. Uh, here we see uh, here we see nice high quality bases. Um, we can't tell, but there are probably reads supporting it from both strands. These mutations are just in the tumor and not in the normal. Uh, here's another case where I think the mutation is that the mutation there, you guys? You can see better than I can on the big yes. screen. So the, this mutation is very uh, rare. So either because there's a lot of normal contamination or because it's a very subclonal event, uh, you might see just one or two or three reads support the, the variant allele. Um, and it, and it, it could be that uh, these are PCR artifacts or it could be that they're true uh, mutations. And in this case, this was a true positive example. So you can appreciate that there are lots of features about this data that affect um, how well and how accurately we can call mutations. Um, and so um, Sorab's lab developed this classifier uh, based approach, it's a machine learning ba uh, based classifier, to sort of learn the features of the data that yielded true positives versus false positives. So these are features like base quality, mapping quality, uh, any strand biases, and so on and so forth. And the idea was to be able to separate those events that are somatic, so found in the tumor and not the germline, those events that were also found in the germline and not just the tumor, um, and those events that weren't really um, uh, events at all. Th those were just uh, false positives. Um, so you can think of these wild types as technical biases and these germlines as true signals, but also uh, they also had a signal in the germline and therefore are not somatic. And so this shows a principal component analysis um, over a uh, feature space of 106 features, so things like this, homopolymer runs and so on and so forth. Um, and it shows that it's possible to separate somatic from germline and wild type. Um, and so you, typically these tools use machine learning classifiers to, uh, to significantly improve calls. Um, and I'll just not go over this in very, very much detail, uh, but these are those 106 features and how they fall into different groups with the somatic, the true somatic events at the bottom, and then the different classes of um, artifacts grouped over here. So these are cases, for instance, where we see low base quality and a certain type of error and strand bias, and you would get that class of mutations. Yes? I guess that depending on the type of cancer, the, the errors you get will be different. So you would have to train your classifier for each kind of cancer, or does it work? Hmm. So the errors, you mean? Um, Any kind of errors that you mentioned? The errors are more platform specific. Okay. So a Lumina platform and different versions of the chemistry would generate specific errors. And so you would, for instance, much more likely want to train on a new version of Illumina uh, sequencing to find that you know perhaps Gs are underrepresented or something like that, um, or certain nucleotide contexts um, are more associated with uh, with error or false positives. Uh, because are you thinking of the mutational context, uh, signatures? And that then, then I guess line versus, uh, versus uh, mutations are going to depend on cancer type. Tissue. The types of mutations will depend on the tissue, yeah. But the types of error are in um, many cases, artifacts that are due to the technology, the sequencing technology, or the alignment algorithm. Any more questions? Yes. There was this one case where it was not obvious in IGB that there was something wrong, like when, the, when they didn't change the parameters and then the mutations were wrong. Like how did they get the idea that this is not a mutation? And if you change the parameters, you don't really know maybe that some other things are wrong? Um, yeah, so if you change parameters, you could, you could induce a different, uh, a different set of, like a different decision of which mutations are true somatic events versus false somatic events. I don't know exactly why uh, that position was called. Um, do you guys know from Sorab's lab why the, the particular, why this case? Uh, had a mutation, but when you look in IGV, you don't see it. It's possible that the, yeah, it's 
it's hard to say without actually having the data. So I don't know. In uh, cases that I've looked at, I haven't really seen this. The only times I've seen something like um, a mutation called and then it's not there in IGV is when you call the mutation on, let's say, the initial BAM file, the alignments, and then you do local realignment or something like that, and you look at that BAM file in IGV. And then in that case, those mutations that were errors could be fixed, so you no longer see it in the, uh, in the visualization because you did the mutation calling and the visualization on slightly different uh, alignment files. Good questions. Any more? Are the uh, mutation signatures, um, does it matter which gene or where exactly it is Because you're only looking for the trend. Yes, for the mutation signatures, um, you you look at what the uh, what the overall um, uh, uh, like frequency of those 96 categories is in your particular cancer or in your particular sample. But it doesn't matter where the gene That would be a separate analysis. So the mutational signature doesn't take that into account, but you could look, for instance, for uh, over-representation of mutations on a particular chromosome or in a particular region. And that, that certainly does happen in cancer. Okay, but the signature, when it, when the signature they don't look at location, but it's just that overall Yes. The, the signature is genome-wide. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've done this part. We've looked at alignments. Um, and now we would want to do mutation calling. We've already talked about co copy number calling yesterday. Um, and so there are a number of tools available um, and widely used for somatic uh, mutation calling and for visualization. Um, Everybody uses SAM tools. If you have anything to do with BAM files, you'll run SAM tools. Uh, this is uh, implemented in C. It's fast and memory efficient. Uh, it's a suite of tools for working with alignment files um, in standard SAM, BAM, or now CRAM format. Have, have people heard of BAM files? Yes? Have you heard of CRAM files? No. CRAM is uh, yet a much uh, more sophisticated way to um, compress data because BAM files are huge. So if you do a lot of sequencing and you generate a lot of SAM files, already BAM is the binary format of SAM, so there is a level of compression and BAM files are smaller. So in the last, uh, I think, two or three years, people have come up with a CRAM format, which is about, I think, a quarter to a third smaller than BAMs. Um, so SAM tools uh, is uh, is a very useful uh, suite of tools that you will use a lot if you do anything with, uh, with sequencing. Um, you may also have heard of the Genome Analysis Toolkit. This is from the Broad Institute. Uh, it's a Java implementation. Uh, it has some important properties including local realignment of indel regions that I mentioned, um, which significantly improves misalignments. Um, and it's actually a suite of tools that performs all sorts of uh, tasks like quality control on the input data, um, as well as germline and somatic variant calling, annotation of the variant effect, and so on and so forth. So you can read more about it here at this website. And a part of this uh, GATK is Mutect. So Mutect and now Mutect 2, actually, are the, uh, the main somatic variant callers that are used, um, uh, for instance, for a lot of the TCGA work. Uh, so this is probably one of the most popular tools for calling mutations. Um, and Mutect did not call indels, but Mutect 2 also call indels. And so it does a uh, joint calling on tumor and normal uh, and has a lot of these filters that we've talked about. It looks at whether there's a, an, a, a gap uh, close to a mutation because of this, um, because gaps are uh, much more penalized than base errors. It looks at strand bias. It looks at uh, whether your mutation uh, is in an area where reads align poorly, um, and thus would be an alignment artifact. Uh, it looks at whether you have two alleles or three and would keep track of that third allele, which many tools don't necessarily do. Uh, and in a very heterogeneous cancer sample, it is possible that at a very small subset of mutations, you might have a third allele. Um, it looks at whether the reads 
um, and in a clustered way. So, if, uh, and also it looks at um, the level of evidence for a particular mutation in the normal sample. So it does all this. Um, it also has the option of screening your mutations against a panel of normals because screening your mutation against a match normal is great for finding somatic events, but there are still uh, places in the genome that are by chance going to generate artifacts. So if you screen against a big panel of normals, you'll get rid of those positions. Um, and then it also has uh, an option to do variant classification and keep track of which mutations in your data set uh, come from dbSNP or not uh, in order to prioritize them further. So it's pretty useful. The other thing that's, uh, that's useful in terms of, of cancer research uh, with this tool is it is uh, fairly sensitive. And so what this graph on the right shows that uh, is that these different lines, the colors, correspond to the allelic frequency of a mutation. So if your mutation is at 40% allelic frequency, then you can find it with pretty good sensitivity, um, even with 10 reads, because on average, four of those 10 reads are going to be the mutation. You might sometimes find it at one read or at six reads, because there's always a bit of a variance in how many uh, reads you're sampling uh, from a population of DNA fragments. Uh, but, and then you can appreciate that as your variant gets less frequent, um, so here's a frequency of 0.2 or 0.1 or 5%, uh, you need more and more coverage in order to find those variants um, in a sensitive way. So if you're looking for a rare variant, Mutex would be a better tool to use uh, compared to some other tools uh, because it is more sensitive to these rare events. Um, another tool, Strelka from Illumina. This was named after the first Russian dogs in, in, in space. Um, so a canine cosmonaut, this, this dog on the right. Uh, so this is a, a color that generates both SNVs and indels. Um, and it's known for being uh, highly specific. So it won't generate as many calls as Mutech, for instance. Uh, it's not as sensitive, but a high percentage of the calls it does generate are going to be true positives, so they will validate. And uh, uh, part of the reason it's more successful than other tools at calling indels is uh, this step where um, it calls candidate indels and then it does a realignment in both the normal and the tumor sample on any positions found to have indels in either the normal or the tumor. Uh, and then it applies a somatic color and, um, and does filtration to um, identify just somatic events. So it's, a, it, it's actually pretty, um, pretty good at this. And indels from Strelka are something that, at least in our lab, we rely on more than indels from any other caller. Um, Mutec 2 now also does indels. I don't know how well it compares with Strelka. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, so all the comparisons are not uh, available uh, for others to read. Uh, but if you have matched normal and tu tumor data and you're not interested in super subclonal mutations, this is a very good color to use. Uh, mutation Seek, you already know about. You used it yesterday in the lab. Uh, this is available as a Python package. It comes uh, with some built-in visualizations for whole genome data, uh, and you can read more, more about it at that link. Um, and we do, when we do mutation variant calling, um, this information, the information that you get from a, a mutation, is encoded in a standardized format. So many of these tools work in different ways, but there is an effort to try to output the same kind of information so that you can, uh, so that you can um, uh, compare not only be between tools, but have a consistent output in terms of structure inf and information. And so the VCF format, the variant calling format, encodes a lot of metrics about the data uh, that could be used to filter or prioritize mutations. Uh, so each line in a VCF corresponds to a mutation, and you'll go over this in the lab in more detail, but essentially each line is a mutation, and you know the chromosome, the start position, and the end position. If it's a point mutation, start and end are the same position. Uh, if it's an indel, then you can encode it in, in different ways. Um, the reference allele, the alternate, and then the quality of the call, and that will be something that's specific to the caller that you used. So different callers, different tools will generate a different quality. Um, and whether it passes or not, uh, built-in filters on that uh, particular tool. And then 
various statistics. So for instance, the read depth, the variant allele frequency. So out of 100 reads, how many uh, supported the variant uh, allele versus the reference allele, uh, whether there was a strand bias, all sorts of, uh, of statistics that would help us to prioritize mutations. Um, so we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more in the lab. Uh, and then one of the most important things to do when you have mutations is to actually look at them. Uh, so we went over IGV uh, just very briefly, but you'll have mutations calls, calls later. And then in your own work, when you generate mutations, it's really important to take a, a quick look, uh, at least at a random set, just to see what your data is like. Uh, it's very easy for us with uh, our brains are sort of uh, natural um, pattern finders. And so it's very easy for us to detect patterns uh, or spot artifacts or whether mutations look uh, real or not. Uh, and so just looking at a handful will give you a real, real, a really good idea of what your data is like. Um, and then if you have any mutations that you want to follow up on, uh, I would certainly look at those um, in a bit of detail. So IGV. IGV is one of the better visualization tools. It's widely used. It has a great uh, uh, tutorial and it's, it's easy to use. Um, you can just launch it from the website or you could download it and use it on your computer. OK, so now we have uh, some variants. We want to annotate them so that we can focus on those that are likely functional and of interest to follow up on uh, versus those that are perhaps synonymous or non-functional or non-coding, uh, et cetera. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in the presentation of uh, candidate semantic variants, would you recommend Um, so in terms of, in terms of mutation calling? Yeah, in terms of being true. Oh, true versus positive. Uh, tr tr true positives versus false positives. Um, yeah, you can certainly do a screen to see if your, if your mutations are generally look real or don't look real. If they, if a bunch of them don't look real, then you might want to adjust the parameters. Uh, or increase the stringency of some filters. Um, and so this can tell you whether your, pra whether your parameters are, are tuned well. Uh, if your mutations look real, uh, they're likely real, but I would still validate them. So whenever we do, um, uh, whenever we have um, a cohort of patients and we've identified some mutations of interest, we will go back to the DNA and do, a, uh, do an assay to validate them in the initial sample, especially if it's a subclonal mutation. Um, and, so, and so it depends on what your purpose is. But if you're going to make a mouse from that mutation, I would validate it first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do any uh, in vitro work before investing all that time and effort, uh, I would certainly validate. Unless it's a very obvious or known mutation, um, I mean, a lot of them from from a lot of calls from Stralka, if they look heterozygous and high quality, and they're supported from both sides or from both strands, and so on and so forth, they will very likely validate. Uh, and then it would be up to you whether you want to spend the time to validate it or go directly to uh, another study. But IGV can give you an idea of, in general, uh, how your data looks and whether your mutations kind of look real. Um, so. Functional annotations. OK, so I want to say a little bit about mutations versus polymorphisms. Uh, we talked a little bit about single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are mutations. So they are changes in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the genome. Uh, the difference between polymorphisms and single nucleotide variants that we consider mutations is that these mutations are present in the germline of a significant fraction of the population. So more than 1% is sort of the rule of thumb uh, threshold. Um, the idea is that if these mutations are deleterious to fitness to the organism in general, or if they're going to cause uh, a big phenotype, uh, it, they will be selected against and become rare. So anything that's very rare in the general population um, is more likely to have a uh, a functional uh, impact than something that is very prevalent. Um, 
those things that are prevalent could be neutral or advantageous depending on the population structure. Um, a lot of these polymorphisms can also be associated with disease susceptibility or drug responses. Um, and so they will differ, differ for instance, uh, between populations. And many of them, like I said, are found in the germline. So they're in every cell of the body. Uh, mutations are infrequent, potentially harmful, usually associated with disease, often somatic. Uh, when they're germline, they're rare, and they lead to these germline predisposition, uh, or they lead to uh, syndromes because a person would have a germline predisposition for a particular um, uh, cellular defect. And so they would be at less than 1% of the population, um, and I, we already talked about that. So one, where do we find these uh, polymorphisms? Uh, well, from databases like the Thousand Genomes Project. So this was a large-scale international research effort uh, that was launched to establish the most detailed catalog of human genetic variation by sequencing the genomes of at least a thousand people. So these are anonymous participants uh, that were volunteers from different populations across the world. Uh, so this catalog of human genetic variation uh, can be used for things like association studies uh, to relate genetic variation specific to a population uh, to diseases in that population, uh, for instance. Uh, and so this figure shows the distribution of populations from which this data is derived. Um, and some just a few, couple of relevant findings, for instance, um, the size of these pie charts corresponds to the number of um, variants in that particular population. So there are lots of variants in the populations of African ancestry. And actually, people of African ancestry have the most variants that are specific to those populations, so not found elsewhere in the world. Um, also, in the pie charts, you can see that there is a significant proportion, so this dark gray area. These are variants that are shared by people across the world. So we have a common ancestry. Um, and we actually share a lot of polymorphisms. And then in the lighter gray, we see um, uh, variants that are shared by a subset of the continents. Um, and then uh, over here in these colors, um, uh, uh, variations that are shared just by specific populations. And so you can see how you can start to associate variants specific to a population with perhaps diseases uh, that occur in that population. Um, and so one of the findings from this is that uh, there are a tremendous number of variants. Everyone has millions of these variants in their genome. Uh, and actually, uh, each one of us carries an average of about 300 uh, variants that cause loss of function in protein, protein, coding, protein coding genes. And so clearly, this loss of function in many of our genes is not uh, deleterious because we are still walking around, even though we are carrying all these loss of function alleles. Um, we also carry around between 50 to 100 variants that have been previously implicated in inherited disorders, and yet most of us are um, not leave from any patients, and so on and so forth. And so, um, and so, annotating uh, your, the mutations that you see in a cancer with this type of uh, information is pretty important because let's say that you find in your cancer, in your tumor sample, that you have a mutation which actually turns out to be um, a loss of function mutation, and it looks very interesting. It's somatic, but it's also in 50% of the world's population. So you would not want to prioritize that variant for any further um, uh, analysis, or you would want to decrease the prioritization for that variant in favor of something else. Um, okay. Have so just an, uh, I added a couple of slides uh, that are not in your in your slide deck. Um, has anyone heard of uh, companies like 23andMe? Yeah, lots of people. Has anyone uh, used a company like 23andMe? <laughs> a couple of people. So uh, this is a kind of a, a a way to join that type of information. And so, essentially, uh, they collect saliva in a tube. Um, you, you send it off to them. They send you a kit. You send it back. And they do what is essentially a snip array. So they do genotyping uh, uh, at a, a few hundred thousand positions. And then they generate a report. It costs $200. Uh, 
Uh, they generate a, uh, a number of different kinds of reports. They can work out your ancestry because a lot of your uh, SNPs will match up to those known populations in the world. Uh, they can generate a wellness report, for instance, um, and a genetic health uh, risk report uh, or a number of reports. So the genetic health risk reports include things like do you carry variants that would put you at risk for um, uh, a certain kind of heart disease, like atrial fib fibrillation or something? And before you read such a report, you have to say, yes, I understand that uh, having a variant in, that increases my risk compared to the population from which I am derived, because they worked out your ancestry, me, doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get this disease. It means that this variant is associated with this disease. And then they give you the lifestyle factors you could do to change your, your risk and so on and so forth. Um, and so here are some example reports uh, for a, uh, I think, a theoretical person. Uh, this is Jim, Jamie some, someone, Jamie K. Jamie K is half Native Indian and half Eastern European. So you can see that from the ancestry composition with a bit of mixture from other populations. Uh, he is not at risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease because he does not carry the variants that would um, uh, be associated with that risk. And uh, genetically, he is predisposed to weigh about 10% less than average. So he's genetically a skinny guy, but of course, if he eats burgers every day of his life, he will not be a skinny guy. And so part of, uh, part of this information tells you what your genetic predisposition is, and then of course your lifestyle uh, factors will affect uh, or, or combine on top of that. So that's the, kind of, that's the kind of information you get from 23andMe, and it really, like, it's just an example of how you would use this information uh, to tell something about populations or individual people. And so this kind of information is collected in databases of variants. So dbSNP has a lot of the annotations from a thousand genomes. Um, the way that data flows into dbSNP is from research labs, sequencing centers, and other databases. And so the, these are, so the, the highest quality data in dbSNPs will be, um, will be from the large consortia like, uh, like thousand genomes or HapMap. And then they actually uh, curate these and come out with, um, um, it's very hard to read on my screen, one second. Okay, so they so for every SNP, you know what the alleles are, A, C, G, or T. Um, you know what the flanking DNA is. So these are things that anyone who reports as, or inputs SNPs to dbSNP has to provide this information, uh, what the individual genotype was in each person, what the population, if known, of the person was or of the individual, um, the population-specific allelic frequency, um, and so on and so forth. And so... The latest version of dbSNP, dbSNP 150, um, has about 130 million SNPs that have a known frequency in human populations. There are way more SNPs in there that came from individual labs that sequenced a sample and found um, germline polymorphisms, and they submitted them to dbSNP, but there's no information on the frequency of that particular variant in the population. So those are not variants that we would use for... Um, for uh, cancer analysis, for instance. Uh, mostly this data is pretty clean. Uh, estimates are that about 8% of SNPs could be false positives because, um, because a SNP, for instance, could be found by a PCR assay that uses primers that also co-hybridize or hybridize elsewhere in the genome, which is a very related sequence, uh, but slightly different, and then that difference will show up as a SNP. Um, the, that's generally not the case uh, from these population resequencing efforts. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention about dbSNP that you should keep in mind is that at some point, dbSNP became contaminated uh, with clinical variants. So it doesn't just contain uh, variants that are associated with the general population. It also became contaminated with variants seen in people, for instance, with, um, uh, with early onset disease of various sorts. And so um, if you're going to screen out anything in your cancer sample uh, that has been seen in the general population, you probably don't want to screen out those events that have been previously associated with a clinical phenotype. And so uh, when you look at uh, 
when you get data from dbSNP, they have this non-flagged version, um, which does not include all those SNPs that are flagged as uh, clinically associated or that are very, very rare in the human population, because those are probably okay to keep if you find in your data. Uh, and then the other, okay, so that's it for dbSNP. Any more, any more questions about that? Yes. General question about filtering for known variants. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that a variant is found in the population doesn't mean it's not a somatic mutation for cancer. So, exactly. So, so. You could find a somatic mutation that is a known variant in the population. And if 50% of people have it, um, then that should weigh a bit in your uh, estimation of the functional impact of that variant. Right. It could be that in that tumor type or that cell type, in that cellular context, that makes a difference. But if you have another functional event that is not in dbSNP, you might want to prioritize that one first. Sure, so you're mostly using this... To annotate. Subset yeah. ...calls rather than actually making... You know, you're not going to use this information to get the full subset, full set. So, yes, usually we exclude things um, annotated in the germline, although you could annotate germline um, mutations in your sample with dbSNP non-flagged, and anything that's left over are personal private mutations to that person uh, that could be associated with their disease. Uh, so you would use this information to annotate your variants and then make decisions based on, on that depending on the type of analysis or cohort you have. That's a good point. Okay, so another uh, database that we often annotate with uh, is COSMIC, so the Catalog of Somatic Mutations in Cancer. Uh, I encourage you to check out the website. Uh, one of the useful, um, one of the useful pages in COSMIC is this cancer gene census list. So this is a, a, a census of, of genes that have been found to be mutated frequently in cancer. So you can annotate your um, variants with dbSNP identifiers, and you can also annotate your variants with COSMIC identifiers. And so if your mutation is found in COSMIC, it has been previously associated with some uh, cancer sample. And so those are probably ones you might want to take a look at. Um, and then in COSMIC, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of information for, um, um, for, for genes, some of which we know a lot more about, like BRCA2. So this is just an example uh, where we see that BRCA2 is actually um, one of the genes that is known to be a gene that drives a cancer hallmark. So it's associated with two cancer hallmarks. Uh, we see here it's associated with genome instability and mutations and escaping programmed cell death. Uh, the role in cancer of this gene is a tumor suppressor gene. So whenever possible, genes are annotated in COSMIC as tumor suppressor genes or oncogenes, if known. Uh, if they don't have an annotation, then that hasn't been figured out yet. Um, and anything else that is known about this gene, like um, what the processes it's involved in and so on. And then in a different page, you can pull up all the different kinds of mutations that have been found for this gene. So uh, in general, missense substitutions are how this gene is inactivated. Okay, so um, the way we apply these annotations to a, a sample is using ANOVAR, um, alternatively SNPF, but ANOVAR is the one we're going to use in the lab, uh, so today you'll, you'll have a chance to, um, uh, to use this. And basically, um, ANOVAR annotates variants in three ways, a gene-based uh, annotation, uh, where for every mutation, if it falls in a gene, it tells you if it's protein coding, what amino acids are affected. Um, it can use RefSeq genes, use CSC genes ensemble, and so on, whatever uh, version of annotations you, um, you have in your project. It, you can also use a region-based annotation, so you can annotate variants in conserved regions, transcription factor binding sites, uh, and so on and so forth. And the filter-based annotation, which is where you would um, you would flag uh, any uh, mutation in your sample that is also in dbSNP or 1,000 genomes or COSMIC and so on. And this includes uh, predicting the effect of a mutation, uh, so whether a mutation is damaging um, and how damaging it is using 
a number of tools. So all these uh, are available as databases. Uh, you can go to this link. It's actually hard to find if you Google it or if you go to the Anavar site, so I put it here. This is, if you go to this link, you will see all the databases that you can download from which you can annotate uh, using Anavar. Okay, so uh, at this point, I want to move on and talk about the actual, what we're measuring um, <coughs> and how we get to cancer cell fractions. So what we measure in, when we count reads is the variant allele frequency, the VAF. Uh, so if you have 10 reads and three of them are um, supporting your mutation, that would be a, a VAF of 0.3. Um, what we eventually want to get to is cancer cell fraction. And um, this less used uh, term called multiplicity. Um, and so I'll talk about these in the context of this diagram. So imagine that we have a tumor which has two copies, so a diploid genome, and it has a heterozygous mutation. So every cell in this tumor has a heterozygous mutation. The purity is 100%. There is no normal contamination. The ploidy is 2. Uh, the mutation multiplicity, so the copies per cell, is 1. And our VAF, our variant allele fraction, is going to be around 0.5. So if you sequence, um, so then that's because there are one, two, three, four, five, six copies of this uh, of this location in our sample, and three of those copies are mutated, right? So three of these six are mutated. Uh, our cancer cell fraction is one because this mutation is present in every cancer cell. That makes sense, right? Um, our VAF is significantly impacted by normal contamination. So here's the effect. Let's assume now that our tumor is only 67, so this, these are the same cells, but now we have 67% tumor purity and 33% uh, normal contamination. So now we still have six uh, copies of this locus, but only two of them are mutated. So our observed variant allele fraction is 2 out of 6, or 0.33, because a lot of sequencing reads will now come from, this normal, uh, from these normal cells. And so we still have a ploidy of 2n, but a lower purity, the same number of mutations per cell, and the same cancer cell fraction, uh, but a significantly decreased VAF. And so when we do mutation calling, uh, uh, what's reported is the VAF. Uh, ideally, you would have purity and ploidy as well so that you can correct your VAF. Uh, when we have a very pure tumor, uh, so the estimated purity of this particular tumor is almost 100%, this is a medulloblastoma, um, we see, usually see a distribution like this, where a number of mutations have a VAF close to 1. So they're, in, they're a homozygous mutation. They're in every copy of every chromosome in every cell. Uh, there are also mutations with a VAF of 0.5, like I showed you on the previous slide, where there are heterozygous mutations in every cell. There are also a number of mutations um, oops, uh, that are subclonal. So their variant allelic frequency is less than 0.5, so they must not be in every cell. If they were in every cell, we would either see them here or here. And so we see subclonal mutations in medulloblastoma. Uh, what happens to the signal, so the signal, this range of peaks, uh, when we have impurity, impure tumors, is it all gets squished to the left. So now it's much harder to say uh, which mutations are homozygous, clonal, or heterozygous, or subclonal, because these distributions, instead of being nice and clear and separated, are now uh, overlapping. So you can't necessarily tell a subclonal mutation apart from a clonal heterozygous mutation in a case like this. Um, and really what you'd want to do in this case is pull, is, uh, is account for purity by increasing the VAF uh, by this proportion, right? Okay, so how does ploidy affect um, our measurement? Uh, in this particular case, we have um, So this is ploidy and also the multi mutation multiplicity. So in this case, we have the same purity, uh, 67%. We have a tetraploid tumor. So now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 copies of this locus in our sample. Uh, but on the left here, we have a mutation that happened 
very likely before um, the tetraploid event. So it's present in three copies of these uh, of the of each cell. So we have a total of six variant copies and ten uh, and ten total copies. So our variant allelic fraction is three. The mutation multiplicities is three. Or sorry, our variant allelic fraction is 0.6. And the cancer cell fraction is, again, one. This, these mutations are present in every cancer cell fraction. Uh, and here, we see that the mutation happens late. Um, so it did not happen uh, before the tetraploid, before the whole genome doubling event. It happened later, and it happened only in a subset of cells. So the mutation multiplicity is, um, is going to be 1. The allelic fraction is now 1 out of 10. And the cancer cell fraction is 0.5. Um, so this cancer cell fraction and multiplicity and ploidy are associated with timing of mutation. So here we see, a, we see an example from medulloblastomas. Um, and here on the left, you can see some diploid tumors with heterozygous mutations. So these are those VAF plots. And we see that most mutations are at a VAF 0.5, which basically corresponds to a tumor kind of like this. Um, and looking at... Um, uh, Doing a fish analysis confirms that this is a diploid tumor, or that all of these are diploid tumors, actually. And we see tetraploid tumors, in contrast, um, have this pattern, where a mutation happens um, after the tetraploidy event, uh, and therefore it's only um, uh, present in about 25% of, um, of, the, of, of the chromosomes. So the mutation allelic frequency can often tell us something about ploidy. Okay, and here we can see how VAFs, uh, VAFs here on the left can be corrected for purity and copy number and classified th then into those that are clonal and present in every cell and those that are subclonal and only present in a subset of cells. Okay, so we can calculate VA uh, CCFs, uh, the cancer cell fraction, if we have the VAF and the purity and the copy number at that locus. So this is how we would do it. Um, we have a term here that um, uh, estimates the contribution to, this, to the signal uh, from the normal diploid cells, uh, and here the effect of the copy number at this locus, and here the effect of purity on the VAF. So basically for an example like this, it would look like this. Uh, we have a purity of 0.67, so every Brown is uh, replaced with 0.67. Our ploidy is 4 uh, at this particular location. Um, and our allelic fraction is 0.1. So we can see that the cancer cell fraction is 0.5. So half the cancer cells contain this mutation. Uh, in practice, when calculating CCF, you'll often see numbers that are um, possibly higher than 1. And that's because VAFs aren't perfect, right? There is an error associated with how many reads you will have that support the variant versus not the variant. Um, purity is also an estimate, right? Uh, and copy number is also an estimate. So these, these values are estimated by tools like Titan, uh, and VAF is, are estimated by tools like Mutect, uh, and so on. And so uh, what I'm showing you here on the right is the CCF at a time point 0.1 versus 2 in a particular tumor, and you can see that What's cut off of this graph is actually a big uh, gray circle that describes that a lot of mutations are actually in uh, a CCF or in 100% of cells at time point one and two, um, and the graph is cut off. But basically, you will see CCFs greater than one. Yes. Does that mean that it's generally overestimated, or? Well, you also see CCF, so you will see this distribution around the true CCF. <clears throat> so you will see that in some cases, depending on oh, if, you're, if you're truly a, a heterozygous variant, you might, and you sequence 10 reads because your coverage is low, you might find 7 reads that support it out of 10, or you might find 3 out of 10. So you could estimate on either side. And then with purity and ploidy, you also have error in estimation. So actually, it's, a, it's, it's not just always overestimating. Sometimes you're underestimating the, the, the cancer cell fraction. Uh, and so basically, the CCF is often uh, used to infer clonal dynamics. So you would see this used in a, in a scenario like this, where you have two different time points, 
or you have two different parts of a tumor and you want to know if the cells that contain this mutation are more prevalent in one or the other sample. So you're tracking cell populations. And so you'd look for it, things like this red, uh, um, this, uh, this, what this red oval represents are uh, mutations that go along together at, in the same cancer cell fraction. And in the time point one, they're found at 10%, roughly, plus or minus some percent. And at time point two, there are now about 75% of the, of the cancer cells have these mutations. And so you'd want to look for patterns like this that don't fall on this uh, diagonal line. Um, so whenever you do time point analysis or uh, regional biopsying, you would be looking for events like this. And you'd want to use a CCF instead of a VAF <clears throat> because different samples will have different purities and possibly different copy numbers. And, uh, you know, the, the stochastic nature of how you sample reads will lead to possibly different VAFs. Um, okay, so it's clear from many examples in the literature that the presence of subclonal mutations is a relevant metric uh, in tumor biology, and in many cases, having subclonal events is associated with poor outcome. Uh, so here we see this for uh, some CLL samples. All these cases on the left have the presence of some subclonal drivers, so CCFs much less than one, uh, and all these cases on the right do not. Um, and there is a big survival difference uh, in these patients. <clears throat> okay, and this is the case, obviously, for more, uh, more types of disease uh, than just CLL. Um, okay, so how well can we detect these important subclonal events? Well, that depends, of course, on our purity, our copy number, and the sequencing coverage. Uh, so here, uh, we see this is a plot from the absolute paper uh, that I mentioned yesterday. And... Um, Basically, we see curves that correspond to different combinations of purity and copy number. So let's say our tumor is this particular uh, green point here. Um, our tumor has a copy number of 6 at the locus of interest uh, and a purity of 0.5. If we have a sequence coverage of 30x, which is a typical uh, whole genome, then we would have a detection power of about 80% to find this mutation. If our, uh, if our copy number was 2, so we moved over on the left here to this pink curve with the same purity level, then we actually have a detection power of 80% with only 20 reads coverage. And so you can see how tumor purity and copy number um, will affect our ability to, to uh, detect these variants. Um, and for, uh, for whole exome sequencing, uh, you actually have read coverage up to, well, it depends how you do exome, whole exome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing is, is typically, typically around 30x. Uh, some people do even up to 50x. But if you're looking for mutations that are, let's say, 0.2% frequency, so in 20% of cells, so these are subclonal mutations, you don't actually have power to detect them um, with this amount of, uh, of purity and uh, copy number unless you had 250 reads. That would give you enough power to detect a subclonal event. So that's even above what most people do for whole exome sequencing. Some people do do very much deeper exome sequencing than uh, we've done in, in, in the past or others have done. Um, and so the amount of depth really will uh, depend on how uh, much power you have to detect subclonal events. Um, okay, so um, just to wrap up in a few slides, uh, finally we have a set of mutations that we think are real. We filtered them, uh, we annotated them, their VAFs are hopefully transformed to CCFs. Uh, so what now? That, that really depends on the type of cohort you have um, and the goals of your project. And so um, some general follow-up activities could include, uh, for instance, um, trying to infer which mutations are important, uh, so which ones are functional. And often we can do that with by looking at their recurrence. So are mutations significantly overrepresented uh, in your cohort from what you would expect? Uh, you could look at patterns of clonal evolution uh, if you have the right kind of data. You could look at mutational mechanisms. Um, and so uh, you could look at the signatures, for instance. 
Uh, and you can look at association with clinical variables uh, like subtype or survival or metastatic potential. Um, and this is something that you'll do in later modules. So interpretation of mutations. Uh, so this is looking at the frequency of mutations in the population uh, with tools like music. So these will predict, um, these will predict, uh, for instance, um, if the mutation of the frequency is more than you would expect by chance. And certain features of genes or a genome will affect how often you would expect to see a mutation. So for instance, there are genes like Titan that are huge. And if you sequence any sample, you will find mutations in Titan. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that Titan is important in that analysis. It means that we have to correct for gene length. Because the longer a gene is, the more likely you are to just get random passenger mutations in it. Um, <clears throat> and so you can use <clears throat> you can use these kinds of tools uh, depending on your cohort. So if you have a large cohort or if you have a good case control study. Um, alternatively, uh, we might look for um, uh, mutations that are, for instance, early initiator events versus later maintenance or perhaps events that promote metastasis. So this is a study uh, where uh, these um, uh, these um, uh, this group, um, Marco Gerlinger and, and team, uh, took multi-regional biopsies from um, uh, from kidney cancers um, that had metastasized, and they saw that. There was convergent evolution, for instance, on certain genes. Um, and so these genes were mutated in different ways in different parts um, of, the, of the tumor or in different lineages of the tumor. And so clearly there, are some, there is some constraint uh, and selective pressure for specific types of mutation. So if you have this kind of data, you'd want to look for uh, convergence on specific pathways. You'd want to perhaps look at those events that are early versus late. Uh, you can interpret your mutational profiles uh, using the mutational mechanisms that we talked about. So perhaps you might find that your cancers are specific, specific etiology. Uh, you might want to look at the mutational processes that have generated them. Um, and finally, um, a really good metric or important aspect of testing for functionality of mutations is to look at the impact of the mutation on expression of, uh, of, downstream, of the downstream pathway. Um, this is one way to look at, at functional impact. So for instance, this is uh, uterine cancer uh, data from the TCGA where all these cases have a mutation in the beta-catenin genes, uh, CTNNB1. So these are all mutant. Um, and mutations in this gene are always associated with activation of this pathway. And so here we see the genes in the pathway that are activated or inactivated, um, and they show up as red or blue. And we can see that a subset of the samples, despite having this mutation, don't have activation of the pathway. And so these are likely passenger events and not actually driver events. So you can start to separate uh, those cases that have functional mutations from pa passenger mutations uh, by analyzing your data um, in the context of um, expression or perhaps methylation or other um, measurements. Uh, and in this particular case, it looks like these tumors that did not have a functional CTNNB mutation were ones that were pole e mutated. So that's a, a mismatch repair deficiency. So those tumors are ultra hypermutated. They have mutations in many, many different genes. They have a huge burden of mutations. So just because you see a mutation in a gene in a hypermutated tumor doesn't mean it's a functional mutation. Okay. Uh, so I think that's all I'm going to say on mutations. Unless you got questions, we can have some coffee and then do some hands-on. Yes, question. So in some um, experiment settings, if they don't have a matched among and there is still ability to identify the somatic mutations? If you don't have a matched normal, you will identify mutations that are somatic plus the mutations that are germline. So then it will be very difficult um, to actually just get a subset of mutations that are somatic. Uh, you can try to eliminate anything that's in dbSNP, for instance, because lots of people will have those events. Those will be a lot of the germline events. But you have 3 million germline events and you know, a handful of functional somatic events. 
maybe 20 or 100. So you could do it. Uh, you could try, and then depending on how lucky you are and your disease, you might find something that um, you might converge on something, but I would say the chances are pretty low. Unless you know that your disease is driven by potentially uh, something that is also a germline, uh, like a P53 or P10 germline deletion or SUFU or patch mutations. There are certain mutations that uh, it doesn't matter if they're germline or somatic, that they will be causative. Mm -hmm.